So let's go for it. Super Saturday, all in one video. If you want to skip ahead to the relevant game for you, that's absolutely fine. Or stay for the whole lot. It was a good Saturday. Ireland, they probably were going to win the Six Nations. They did. Well done to them. Here's the table. 20 points to them. Clear winners. But the big battles, I guess, were in the middle between France and England. Who's going to finish second? And then on the bottom, who's going to get that wooden spoon? Who's going to get that last place? And it was Wales with zero wins. Big win for Italy there. So an exciting day for sure. Some interesting games. Let's get into it. Starting with Wales versus Italy. 21-24 in the end. It looked like it was really close on the scoreboard. But Italy were probably well-deserving winners. Wales leaving it far too late with a last-minute try there from Grady, bringing it close. But Italy had done the damage in that first bit of the game. And Wales, they're going to go away and think how they can improve. Maybe it came a bit too early for some of their youngsters who were forced into the Welsh team and they're going to get better but Italy definitely look like they've come of age some fantastic tries let's get into this game talk about some of the key moments some of the key takeaways and in the first 10 minutes yeah very nervy from Wales forcing the phases and the Italians looked confident. We had Montiuani stepping and turning Costello inside out first of all that was impressive and Garbisi started his looping work. He does a lot of looping work behind the back line and it caught out Wales again and again. In the first 10 minutes, that looping plate freed Lewis Liner down the right. He had a really good game actually for Italy. I think he's very much in that Italian team now. So that's 0-3 straight away. So good start for Italy, a well-deserved lead. Now in this whole match, Wales did enjoy some good possession, but their carries in this first 20, I think were powder puff. Too easy for the Italians to deal with. No penetration behind the gain line. Easy targets for Jackals. Lamaro was on fire in this game. Another penalty Jackal, 0-6. Really ugly start from Wales. Drop balls, not helping. And even the tight calls weren't going their way. And the energy was going to Italy, which is exactly what Wales didn't need. And then on 20 minutes, the first of the Italian beautiful tries and the best back they've developed for years, Menoncello, he's involved a lot. He easily gets gain line from an off-the-top line out far too easily for Wales. And another Garbisi loop, and it's that man, Menoncello, again hitting a hard line to get in behind Wales. Then some tight phases, sucking enough defenders. Out it goes for Ioane to go through a gap, and it's almost the perfect try. 0-11. The only bad thing was the kick from Garbisi. BC. Goodness me, he shanked that one a treat, a really easy kick. He got some hard ones later on, but that's kind of Garbisi. He does shank some horrible kicks and then make some really hard ones. And yet, Wales have slept walk through the first 20 minutes of this game. They need to give themselves a slap or the game is just going to pass them by. And they did give themselves a slap, but it was far too late in the end. Nothing's working for Wales. I made a note on 25 minutes. Their first decent handling of the game gives him a sniff of an overlap. But Montiuani, who's having a great game, spots the danger, fires up on the blitz or win it, who just panics a touch and fumbles. Dylan Lewis, who's been brought in maybe to get the scrummaging going. He's struggling there, Italy on top in the scrum, so it's not going well at all. Then a glimmer of hope for Wales. On 25 minutes, Garbisi has another kicking glitch. He hits a shank of a crossfield kick this time. And Thomas Williams is good on the counter-attack. He makes the incisive break. But again, the captain Lamaro, superhero stuff for the big jackal penalty. On half an hour, at this point, you can tell that Wales have actually started to up the urgency finally. And the defence is forcing Italy to resort to the kick. And Italy did have to kick a lot in this game. Wales did force them to stop at times and attack. But then a horror show mix up on half an hour between the youngsters of Winnet and Costello. That causes a deep kick to be gifting Italy field position. Uh, Wales, they're, they're stepping up their ferocity of tackle, that is for sure, but they are looking a little desperate when they get possession, trying to fling it around too dangerously from deep, something they've done all championship. I mean, Yes, they're taking the shackles off from Gatland, but goodness me, I think they do take too many risks for a side that's still very young. One shining light in these early stages, 
fittingly, is George North, his final test for Wales. He had a solid game. He had to be literally helped from the field at the end there. He gave his absolute all so he can go away from his Welsh career with his head held high. Now, on 35 minutes, I'm making a note that the Welsh game's improving, but Italy know that Wales like to work the ball wide very quickly. They don't go through a too many phases until they go wide, and Italy are shutting it down very nicely. And I think that's an overall takeaway for Wales in this tournament is just more patience. The last 10 minutes of the half is fairly even, but Italy, they're still screaming into those tackles and rucks that are doing really well. With a minute to go before half time, a move that just sums up Wales' half, lovely off the top ball for Tompkins, who knocks it on. The big bagel at half time, 0 11. The second half starts pretty well for Wales, actually, winning some ball in the air. Josh Adams looking pretty good. He had a better game in this game, and they work dire into space, which is good, but then kill it with a neck roll. And every time they got into good positions, they did something silly. Then just as Wales are starting to pick up, Italy launch a killer play from within their own half. They work it wide beautifully. Ioani hits a straight line. He makes the break. He feeds Parney, the fullback, who is covering for Kapowatsu, who's injured. And he swerves with great pace, outruns the cover of Dyer, and turned to win it inside out for an unbelievable finish. And he knows it's good from his face. And Kapowatsu, who, I mean, that's a bit harsh, but goodness me, what a replacement for Kapowatsu. You guys in the comments before the tournament told me to watch out for Parney, and I can see why. So brilliant try. 0-18, Garbisi nails with the difficult kick, of course. So what a great lead for Italy. And can Wales come back? Well, they couldn't quite, but that was a killer, killer move. And that Welsh midfield has been picked apart quite a few times, but you've got to say it's brilliant play from Italy as well. Their decoys, the timing is perfect. The looping of Garbisi is shredding them apart. So really impressive attack from Italy. And interesting to see, Gatlin makes a bold call. He puts Grady on for Tompkins, who has dropped the ball a fair bit. But then Grady, he kind of catches the dropsies, if you like, straight into the 22, and he drops it cold. So that is pretty frustrating for Welsh fans. In the second half, you wouldn't say that Italy dominated it. They were playing pretty pragmatic, really, getting to halfway, popping the box kick up. They know Wales like to attack from deep, and they just let them do it, watching their patterns, letting them run out of energy. Because, yeah, possession hadn't been a problem for Wales. On 62 minutes, it's taken over an hour, but Wales, they do get on the board. This time, they go simple, to the mall, to the muscle, and D goes over. So at least they don't finish on 0 7 18. And that's just given Wales a sniff of a chance, and they do step it up a bit. Again, another good entry towards the Italian 22, but another terrible mistake. A cold drop from Mackenzie Martin, the story of the match for sure. And it looks like the nail in the coffin with a series of two penalties nailed over by Garbisi, then Pace Rayo with a good long ranger. But in the last couple of minutes of the game, Wales spring to life. Roland's muscles over. There's one more play and Hardy, who's brought lots of energy to Wales. He gets some gain line. Grady makes a bust and pops up again to hack on and score. So crazily enough, at the end, it's 21-24. A crazy end. It looks like it's close, but really Italy were deserving winners. Wales they'll be disappointed zero wins from the six nations but you hope those youngsters are going to get better for italy some brilliant attacking play they deserve the win they can go away with a lot of positives and a word for our sponsor lifting giants they've invented lifting blocks that fit to your hands improve your line out lifting it's been proven in university studies if you want to get hold of a pair rugby analyst 20 will give you 20 percent off just to the end of this week so do get involved in that in the links below then on to the game that sealed the Six Nations for Ireland, 17-13 against Scotland. Scotland, they battled really hard. They tackled incredibly well. They numbered up in defence really well, but they didn't trouble that Irish line enough. Ireland, they weren't at their best in the first half, but when they turned it up, it was too much for Scotland and they deserved to win and get the Six Nations in front of their home fans. That's pretty cool. Let's get into the game early on. The obvious box kick battle. Kinghorn looking particularly good in the air as he did all game. And James Lowe gets charged down by Christie, who had a fantastic game. And if it bounced differently, Scotland could have scored then. But anyway, getting into the game, we're having the kicking battle. And Lowe's second error, crawling along the ground, actually gives Scotland the lead. Russell, 0-3. On 10 minutes, Ireland are starting to get into their systems. But it's a dozy offside from Van der Merwe. 
and Scotland spot the trick play from the line out to bundle Sheehan into touch so they have the throw in and then they give the ball straight back to Sheehan incredibly costly overthrow from Turner so Sheehan just says thank you very much and flops over the line and Ireland do get the score so a strange way to go ahead 7-3 and in this first half it's pretty even to be honest but a poor offside from McCarthy does give Scotland another chance there so 7-6 and that reflects the game pretty well evenly matched but some phenomenal tackles and jackals from Christie he was amazing then van der Fleer gets one back quality on both sides not many points but really good to watch actually Ireland on 25 minutes are getting through their phases pretty well but the blue line is very quick to reload and get in position they're not falling for the decoys like I said Christie particularly impressive in that ruck area so they're not getting through our island and then we get the first clean break of the match it's taken almost half an hour and it's pure one-on-one -on -one. McDowell actually shrugs off the best Irish tackler Bundiaki but Scotland can't capitalize but certainly that's a feather in the cap for McDowell on Aki and then the scrum the scrum really goes wrong for Scotland. On half an hour, it's the first big scrum win to Furlong. He pops up Schumann. Fantastic work from the Irish scrum. Really helped them win this game. But Scotland scramble again from Dempsey and my player of the half, Christie. They turn it over. So Scotland, they're starting to hang on a little bit. And Schumann's pinged again on 34 minutes. Dozy play really as he just drifts behind Christie who's hitting a line so that's a penalty but a bad miss from Crowley who pulls it wide and Ireland they're edging the game in possession but the Scottish defence is pretty good they're not over committing so 7-6 at half time a fairly accurate a reflection of the game now in the second half Ireland really step it up they've definitely had a bit of a rocket at half time I'd say and Lowe starts it off by bumping off Kinghorn and staying in one hit holding off Jones and offloading stack of phases a well won penalty a sheer weight of phases 10-6 good start for Ireland Scotland they're showing their defence is really good but they can't just defend for the whole half and they do do a lot of defending in this half a horror restart from Russell the Scottish scrum is being shattered for the second time this time Porter's side does the damage and Ireland are putting more pace on the carry significantly more Henshaw impressive he does three big uh, thrusts in this attack on 44 minutes and another well-earned penalty and Ireland they're stepping up the pace they smell blood they go for the tap lovely tip on pass from Burn to Furlong he stays really strong goes through three tackles stretches over and if you'd asked me if he would grounded it I'd probably say yeah probably just about but because the ref says no try on the pitch it's not given I think it would have been given if the ref had said it was a try on the pitch so maybe that was a bit of a tough one Scotland dodging a bullet and they just can't dodge too many bullets because Ireland have stepped it up in defense as well big shots again from the likes of Lowe who had a great game interesting to compare James Lowe to uh, Van der Merwe. Van der Merwe is kind of a one-trick pony but his trick is very good which is give me ball I run and Lowe's got the kick he's got the pass he's just a little bit more uh, of a thinker an all-rounder but interesting in this game I think you saw it a little bit and yet Ireland are just folding up the Scottish scrum like an origami hat massive danger signs there as it just falls over backwards uh, that's never good for a set piece and Ireland are really turning up the power with Gibson Park pulling the strings they work it wide and Nash nearly steps inside six Scottish defenders but Christie again there to save the day they are holding on they're only four points down but they're staying in the fight and that is the main thing Ireland are stepping up their straight runners which is making a big difference they're not just playing their patterns they are playing some power as well then on 62 minutes a messy ruck from Scotland gives Ringrose a sprint clear but Van der Merwe and Horn track him back well but there's just too much green pressure too much pace on the ball lovely little delays on the passes Scotland's are tackling for their lives and getting in position very quickly but then it's another straight line from Henshaw who's been awesome this match his best match of the tournament he goes over TMO check but Redpath who's on in the centre and he makes a big impact what an unbelievable hold up tackle but there are too many penalties so it's a yellow card to Ashman and they just tap and pile over Porter piles over he loves it he loves a fight like this a physical game he had a massive game when he went off he celebrated with the crowd so that's 17-6 so that's a pretty significant blow Scotland just couldn't hold out forever 
Scotland are in trouble with Ashman off. I think they have to get Fagerson throwing in, but that goes really badly. Scotland are hanging on in defence, but they haven't really come close to scoring in this second half. We know the scrum is no good. Rowe kicks out on the full. They give away a line-out penalty. It looks like they're almost broken, but they do get a slither of a chance with Harry Byrne copping a yellow for a silly upright tackle. So they have a dash with Redpath and Horn who have come off the bench and really injected pace. They make a break and Jones slips through Henshaw and Doris and steps low. A wonderful individual brilliance try. 17-13. Yeah, Redpath in particular has made a big difference. They've got a couple of minutes to try and nick it, but it's a horror drop from Fagerson, who had a game to forget, to be honest. And it's all over. Arnold win 17-13. I think they deserve it. They were the better team. They turned it on in the second half. Well done to them. Yes, they were disappointed not to win it last week against England, but nice to win it in front of their home crowd. It's hard to win a Grand Slam, as we've seen here, but yeah, they deserve the championship. Pop the comments below on that game. So on to the last game of Super Saturday, probably the best game. France 33, England 31. France, I think, deserve the win. More dominance, more pace, more power. England, though, some brilliant attacking play. Scored some absolute worldy tries. So a good one to watch. And the game started with so much passion and pace and power from France. England could have been blown away quite early. Their mall just got robbed. It looked like men against boys at times. And certainly the French power and size was ridiculous. France desperate to get the ball wide, but the English blitz is good to start up with. The English blitz will come onto it in this game. It's really good for them and it kills them. I don't know what to make of it. England just need to vary it a bit more, but we'll come on to that. The French mall was looking huge, but England dealt with that pretty well. And England looking to counter-attack. They were kicking the ball a lot, looking to get the ball back and counter-attack. Freeman on five minutes with a big carry back, but Pinot explodes Lawrence into touch. Some huge hits there. And England, yeah, just trying to take the sting out of the game. Not necessarily a bad start from England, but the power of France was just crazy. So the first mission was survive the first 10 minutes for England. They did that. The next mission is survive the scrummaging from Antonio and the big boys. And they do that. The English scrum is really good in this game. They get a few penalties, free kicks as well. So that's a tick in the box there. And France just trying to play at 100 miles an hour. England much more controlled. An interesting battle in stars for sure. England clearly kicking as a strategy a lot more, which you'd expect them to do up against the powerful French, trying to use Daly and Freeman on the chase. France kicking it back and England trying to counter. Having said that, the first counter Marcus Smith does is he's kind of going nowhere and he gets held up very easily. So that's three all at that point. And then, goodness me, on 90 minutes, pure French brilliance. England have a line out and Cross nicks the line out off Chesham there. They work the ball wide and England, they fly up in the blitz, even though they're not organised. I don't like this at all because you've got Lawrence playing at 13 and Slade at 12 for attack. And obviously they switch for defence. So as they're flying up, they try and switch on the run, which surely is a bad idea. They get it all wrong. They try and blitz from being on the back foot. And France getting out wide with Biel Barry, who was so much quicker than any other English winger out there. It was quite scary. And Biel Barry feeds Le Guerrec for the try. A brilliant try. But England surely have to drift on that sort of play. Does Felix Jones want them to blitz on absolutely everything? is my question. Let me know what you think. Biel Barry nearly gets another as Lawrence knocks on. Pano hacks and Biel Barry outpaces Freeman and nearly outpaces Smith to score. But Smith has to take it over the line. But again, England scrum really good against the big French to save the day. So England doing well. They're hanging on. But the desperation for England to blitz every single time from broken play is killing them a bit. And Olivon breaks from one of these blitzes and France nearly score. But they get the penalty. Nice kick from Ramos. 13-3. France, they just look like they've got more individually than England. But England are feeding them chances by this crazy blitz at all times. England fly up and six of them can't touch Pano. That's a good example of that blitz. And England leaking penalties, another one, 16-3 from 50 metres this time. And like I said, it is a bit men against boys at times. Earl getting bounced off, Otoje getting bounced off. 
but they're hanging on in there. Kicking, however, is giving England a bit of joy. From a kick, Smith chases and does really well to collar Pinot into touch. That was a big moment. Lots of penalties from France. England turn down the points and go to the line out. Five metres out three times, but England's ball isn't strong enough to get over. But Fiku gets caught ball watching in midfield and Lawrence just changes his angle slightly and busts straight through under the post. Huge moment. England needed that. 16-10. And that was the turning of the tide, at least for five or six minutes. Because after half time, wow, what a start. An almost perfect attack. It's a fizzing wide flat pass from Slade. Brilliant pass to Freeman right on the gain line. And he goes back the other way to the left. Another dead flat pass this time from Ford right in the face of the French defence. To Underhill, he breaks off lows to Earl. It's panic stations for France. They can't hold on and Lawrence does well to stretch and score so try there 16-17 but oh my god England are on fire they managed to work Freeman free on the right but he hasn't quite got the pace of other wingers but they keep on going they get another line out they manage to put Earl in between Ramos and Deportier not very good defence at all tickle tackles and it is a try there 16-24 so England they're ahead by eight just like that six minutes after half time pure attacking heaven for England from then on, they're back on the back foot again. But Ford's technicality and his kicking is fantastic. Tactically kicking, brilliant. Slowing the game down when he needs to. But the French mall is getting going. England are in trouble. And the French, they're throwing the kitchen sink at England. And it finally tells as Le Garrick and Olivon manage to pop the ball over the top a couple of times for the fullback Barry to score. So back to a one-point game, 23-24. And France clearly outpower England. But England need to be technically spot on and they are pretty good in certain uh, areas. Tuolangi's on for Slay. They try and even up the power. Doesn't particularly work, to be honest. And then a bit of a balls up that maybe cost England the match, to be honest. A bad overthrow from Dan. Ramos hacks on. It's a little lucky, but it bounces for Pinot. He feeds Fiku. It's a try. 30 points to 24. So that was a real coming down to earth after being ahead. And after England, six minutes of brilliance. It's been all France. The scrum, though, is the highlight there for England. They're holding the big French at bay. Another note, Marler's doing his job in the scrum, but goodness me, compared to the rest of the England forwards, he's so slow getting off the line. But no, that's why he's there, to hold up the scrum. With 10 minutes to go, England have been hanging on for about 25 minutes. Ramos misses a penalty, which helps. Then a final big play from England, could have won the match. Don Brandt chops the tackle, roots Jackals. They go deep into the 22 with another brilliant kick from Ford. Goodness me, he punted like a dream today. Then brilliant hands again from Ford. Smith draws and gives really nice. Freeman scores. Top try again. England are ahead 30 points to 31. With only a few minutes left, can they hang on? No, they can't, because France, they are on the attack all the time. The lion's share of possession and territory. Earl gets pinged for a no-arms tackle and 50 metres out from Ramos and he absolutely nails it. So what a game. Like I said, I think France probably deserve it, but brilliant attacking play from England. They do need to find a bit more physicality from somewhere. They still need to work on that blitz, when to do it, when not to do it. They probably need to power up a little bit as well to compete with France. But anyway, a good end for both teams there. France second, England third. Sounds about right to me. Pop all the comments below from Super Saturday. I'd love to know what you thought of that day and I'll catch you next time.